so lovely to see you all once again on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. I can see some of you have just gotten up from your sleep. Uh, <laughs> but uh, here in the mountains, the monsoon is in full swing. The From my window, I usually see the view of the beautiful Dawladar mountains. But today, the clouds have just come down. Uh, they've covered all the mountains. So uh, that's the scenery. I just wanted to share with you the scenery of the present space where I am. <laughs> yes, with that, Swatiji, we can uh, start today's satsang. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Anishia, first question is being asked by Aditya Ji from Delhi. He's asking, why spiritual journey takes so long to transform a human being and how to make it fast? <laughs> well, um, who's asked this question? Was there a name? Adit Aditya. Aditya. Okay. Um, yeah. So Aditya, we don't ask this question when we uh, enter into the school for our education, then our college, then all the degrees that we that we get, and then finally we are able to get a job. Uh, we don't ask this question then, saying that why does it take so long to actually go and you know earn a living? Uh, it's a period of 18, 20, 25 years that we spend in that process. But when it comes to spiritual sadhana, we seem to be in some kind of hurry. Yeah, we want it to happen very, very fast, very quickly, somehow. So, few things, Aditya, to ponder over here. I'll give you a few pointers. Pointer number one: there is a tendency of the mind to get the object of its desire immediately. That's a tendency of the mind. If your mind wants to get a particular object, let's say a new phone, whatever your desire is, a new kind of food, a, a new event, a new experience, the mind will create an urgency for that. It wants to fulfill the desire now. Yeah. There's an urgency that the mind creates. It's a mind-created urgency, right? Point number one. So mind is always in hurry because, as we say, it's a monkey mind. It doesn't rest. It doesn't take things easy. It doesn't want to allow the flow of life to take place, right? So it creates this urgency and it creates ripples. And because of that, the beautiful flow of life and the spiritual journey that is happening gets hampered. It's like, you know, I've written a book and I've given it the title, Let the Mud Settle. It's exactly this. When some, let's say there's a pool of water and, and, a, and a bike just passes through it, suddenly you will see the entire water becomes muddy. Yeah. Now, if you your mind is in urgency, hurry, it will try to clear the water very, very quickly. It will do all kinds of things with the water. But what it needs to really do is take a step back, wait, allow the water and the mud. The mud gets settled on its own and the water becomes clear on its own. Yeah, so it needs to take a step back. So that's pointer number one. Pointer number two, still the question is why does it take so long for us to transform? Because Aditya, there are layers and layers of conditioning that we have allowed our mind to get encapsulated with. We live every day of our life strengthening these habits and these conditionings. As you can see, this habit of hurry is also a conditioning of the mind. For our entire life, at least in this Janama, in this incarnation, we've been strengthening these conditionings. 
whatever you repeat gets strengthened right you remember when we were a ch children how did we learn the the tables in the school in india we repeated it a lot every poem that you learned in school every story that you learned in school when you were young and you still remember those poems or those stories why because you repeated it a lot so whatever you repeat becomes stronger and practice makes us perfect so we've been practicing our conditionings a lot we are practicing our habits a lot and they are getting strengthened and when we now start to walk the spiritual journey it takes a time because layer by layer you cut through those conditioned patterns it takes an effort every day you have a set routine you wake up from the bed you your hand reaches out to the phone you swipe a few apps if you look at this first 15 20 minutes of your every day are exactly the same as if we are operating like machines because of the conditioned patterns so it takes a while aditya for the conscious effort to come in to cut through these unconscious layers unconscious patterns unconscious behavior and conditioning spiritual journey is all about bringing conscious element into every thought that i think every word that i speak every action that i perform all these three things my thoughts my words my actions need to be conscious but so far our training the way we have trained ourselves our thoughts are random we are not mindful of what we are speaking most of the time we are also not mindful of our behavior everything is very unconscious in our system even the movements of our hands fingers if you see my hands are moving most of the time when we speak our our body language our hands are animated for most of the people this is an unconscious behavior can we bring conscious element into this so as you start to bring conscious element into your thoughts your words your actions you start to cut through the layers of old patterns and conditions and that's what takes time that's point number 2 point number 3 here keep aside the notion of time that why does it take long anything aditya that you fall in love with the notion the dimension of the time ceases if you are with your beloved somebody you love a lot and if you are with that person at that moment the dimension of time does not exist you don't even realize how much time it has passed since the two of you are sitting here why does that happen because at that moment you're in deep love with this person and time stops or time dimension disappears right but in spiritual journey we're talking about time we're talking about why should it take so much for me to transform into spiritual journey so it's an indication that you've still not fallen in love with the process itself maybe it's an indication that the process itself is a have to for you you understand have to i have to do this i have to do my morning practice i have to sit in meditation it has probably become a routine or a have to or a burden because that's when mind will crave for hurry i want to just get this done quickly because it's causing me uncomfort correct if you fall in love with this journey if you fall deeply in love with the spiritual process itself 
the notion of why should it take long will disappear. There's a lot of stories around this, where the bhakta, the devotees, the disciples said, Oh, Master, I'm enjoying being in your presence so much. Who now cares for enlightenment? I'm in love with this presence, Master. Oh, Guru, I'm in love with your presence. What care do I have to reach the final shore of awakening? While I'm, I'm totally in love with this moment. There have been stories and stories around this, real stories of a lot of disciples like that. So the indication I'm giving you here is cultivate your love affair with the spiritual process. Cultivate your love affair with the spiritual journey. Cultivate your love affair with your deity, with your God, with your Guru. And then you will realize and then you will see. OK, I must add another thing. Cultivate your love affair with the practice that you follow. Cultivate your love affair with the discipline, the regularity of it. As you cultivate this love affair, this question will disappear. That why should it take time? Think about this, Aritya. Yeah. So these are four pointers I've given you. If you contemplate on these pointers, you will see where are we going wrong. You will see why is it taking too long for us. And you will see how does our mind behave, creating this sense of hurry or urgency. Yeah. With that, thank you. Ji Swati. Thank you, Anishi. And we move to the next question. Yes. Our next question is from Ravi from Mumbai. He's asking, is God a person or a consciousness? Is it possible to meet God or is it impossible? Hmm. The answer to this is both, Ravi. God is a person and God is a consciousness also. Again, mind wants to choose one, either or. Mind operates in either or. For mind, it's very difficult to comprehend the union. Union of two seemingly opposite dimensions. Yeah. So. God is a person and God is also consciousness. In Indian tradition, Ravi, we've always talked about Nirakara. Nirakara is God which is formless, which has no akara, no form. We call it consciousness. So one aspect of the God is Nirakara, where there's just no form we attribute to our God. It's a pure consciousness. It's pervading everywhere, around you, inside you, everywhere. It's only that. That consciousness alone is making me speak. That consciousness alone is making you hear this. It's encompassing all of us. Then in our tradition, we also say Sakar, Sakar Rupa, God with Akar, which means God with the form. That's the reason we give the form to Shiva. We give a symbol to Shiva as a Shiva Linga. But if you go into the deepest Vedanta, we will say that Shiva is just the consciousness pervading everything. Right? So, in our tradition, we gave this choice to the seeker, to the disciple, saying, whatever you are able to connect with, please follow that. It's your choice. In fact, Swami uh, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, the great Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Guru of Swami Vivekananda, he used to say, and I also say the same thing, it is, it is good and beneficial for a sadhak, for a seeker, to first approach God with the form. Have your God as a form, 
the form could be Shiva, Hanuman, Krishna, Rama, Devi, whosoever, whichever form you like. The form could also be a tree, a river, a mountain. These are also the forms. Because we are operating in this form, our sense of identity is in this form. So for us to connect to another form becomes easier. For this form, connecting to the connecting to the formless becomes difficult. It becomes an abstract idea. So Ramakrishna used to say, connect with the form. For him, he has deep uh, devotion, love with the form of Kali. So God exists in both form and formless. Choice is yours. And I said, it is always easier to connect with the form, God with the form. And a time might come or might not even come when the form will disappear, right? When you will start to see God everywhere. Now you will not see God in only your statue of Krishna or Shiva. Now will you now you will see Shiva everywhere, right? The transcending of the form will happen. So that's one aspect of it. Second, <clears throat> can I see God? It's like saying, Ravi, can I see space? The fifth tattva, the space. Huh? The Vishuddhi, the, the fifth chakra, the fifth tattva of this existence. I want to see space. Can I see space? But space is all around. Around you is space. Within you is all space. You are existing in this space. Where is the point of seeing the space? Do you follow this? Because space right now in your consciousness, in your perception has no form. Let me repeat. Because space in your perception right now has no form, you're not able to see this. But then you can experience this. How? My hand is moving. Where is this hand moving? In the space. If you cage my hand where there's no space in a drum, in a box, I can't move my hand because there's no space. I am experiencing the space, the God Tattva, the God element. And we come back to the same thing. If for you, you have prescribed God as a form, then you will see the form everywhere. You know, we are somehow in love with the form of Shiva. I am somehow in love with the form of Shiva. Now I see that form everywhere. We have a Shiva temple. We see the form there because there the Shiva Linga is there. But I look at the mountains, I see the form of Shiva there. I look at the clouds, the formation of the clouds, I see the form of Shiva there. If the form is in your heart, you will see the form everywhere. You ask, can, you, can I see God? Yes, you can see God. First, the form has to be in your heart, whatever that form is. There are devotees of Krishna I meet. They carry the form of little Krishna with them everywhere they go. Because whenever the desire in the heart arises, oh my Krishna, I want to see you. They just take Krishna out from their bag and bow down to the Krishna. For them, he is real. <clears throat> For them, he is real. And there's a, there's a beautiful uh, poetic line in Urdu on this. I think it was written by Mirza Ghalib, if I'm not wrong. It says, Sar jhukaoge to patthar devata ho jayega. So that small little stone that you see as stone, if you have deep reverence in your heart of seeing God in that stone, and if you bow down to that stone with deep reverence of your heart, then that stone itself will become your God. It all depends on your reverence. And if you have deep reverence for the entire cosmos, 
then for you, God has transcended the form. Now you see it in your neighbors, your family people, people who irritate you. You see God in them also. Things that are not nice to you, you see God's hand or God in that, in them too. You start to see God everywhere. The distinction of nice and not nice, good or bad, disappears. Then you see God in the Deva and you see God's hand in the Asura also. All distinctions disappear. That's what God with the formlessness. Yeah. So think about this and make a choice. And remember what Ramakrishna said. If you really want to see and experience God, God with the form it should be the starting point. Your love, your reverence for the God in Swarupa, in the form, will help you. Meditate on this, Ravi, and see where it leads you. Thank you. Jiswati. Katy from Dharam Court is asking this question. She's asking, how do you describe surrender? She's here also. I think she has joined us today. Yeah. Very important question. For uh, a sadhak on the path, especially the sadhak, the seeker, has more devotion in the heart. So how do you describe surrender? What is surrender? Let's talk about something that we all experience so that it's easy for us to comprehend this. No matter who we are right now, no matter what our age is, no matter where we are sitting in this session right now, at some point or the other in our life, we all have experienced deep love. Deep love for someone, with someone. We've all experienced that across the board. What is the feeling when we are in deep love? There's a deep trust that we have in that person, our beloved. Yes, along with that, there are a lot of expectations also that we have. There are a lot of desire also we have with that person in love. We're talking about human love right now, Katie. A good human love. These are the qualities of human love. Most of the time our human love, and I'm using the word human love, why? Because this love that we experience with somebody is not fully purified. There are desires in that. There are expectations in that. There are elements of jealousy in that. There's an element of holding, possessing in that. We all experience this. We all experience these emotions along with the love that we experience with somebody. Right? We want to do things for our beloved. We want to cook for our beloved. We want to, you know, whatever in our capacity. We want to do that. Offer that to our beloved. Human love. There are elements of impurification in this case. When this love starts to transcend and you're on the spiritual path, the same love starts to transcend to the higher level. What does it mean of transcending this love? Basically, this same love starts to get purified. The demands drops. The expectation starts to drop. Now you're not demanding anything. The demands, all demands start to drop themselves out. Your expectation starts to drop out. Your holding starts to drop out. Every 
impurity starts to drop out. And you start to experience something which you've never experienced in life, which is extremely pure like the space. And it expands. Slowly, it starts to expand itself. You start to feel deep expansion of the heart. Surrender is getting activated. Now, there's a deep trust in the object of your love. And I'm now using the word object instead of the person. Why? Because now this love which is getting purified could be associated with still a person, could be associated with an image of Shiva as an object, a, a, a photo of Shiva, a space of Shiva, or could be associated with a Guru, could be associated with anything, could be associated. Now this purified love could also be associated with, let's say, a tree, with a river, with Ganga flowing with the vast ocean, with the mountain, anything. And now, for the first time in your life, you will start to experience deep surrendering, which is absolute trust in that object of your purified love, in that deity, that guru, that mountain of your purified love. Absolute trust in that. What does it mean? You see, so far, our trust is very conditional. Our human trust is very conditional. If everything is going right with somebody, we have trust. But suddenly, if things are not going the way I want them to go, the trust shakes. Listen to this carefully. Till the time life is happening according to you, you have trust. Till the time a person behaves according to you, you have trust in that person. The moment life does not go according to you, the moment a specific person does not behave according to you, the trust shakes. Not just in that person. Our trust also shakes in the whole phenomena of love. I meet people who say, no more love in this life. Their fundamental trust has shaken because their love was not purified. They had not yet developed deep surrender. Because deep surrender, the trust that comes out of it is unshakable. Things happen according to you. Things do not happen according to you. Your surrender does not shake. Your trust does not shake. There are layers and layers in this, Kitty. And the next layer is, which then means for steep, authentic, pure surrender to happen, all your definitions and all your desires must also put aside. Your definition that I am trusting life so much, and this is my definition of life's functioning, this definition must be kept aside. Because you do not know how life functions. Life will keep surprising you. And if you have deep surrender for life, you will enjoy these surprises. But if you don't have this deep surrender for life, this deep love affair with life, then these surprises will trouble you. Then you will question, why is it happening to me? You will enter into the victim mode. So surrender means deep unshakable trust. Surrender means absolute, purified, unshakable love affair. That's what surrender really means. And as the surrender grows, your sense of I, me, and minus also drops. But it's only Shiva that works through you. It's only your Guru that works through you. It's only this existence that works through you. You are no more. For Ramakrishna Paramansha, let's talk about him again. He was so surrendered to Ma Kali, and Kali was just a statue in a temple in Calcutta. He was so surrendered to Kali that for him, Kali was alive. Kali became a living form, 
living entity for Ramakrishna Paramansa. To the extent that he would go to the Kali, offer food to her, and he will refuse to eat food unless Kali takes the food first. Kali is Ma, the divine Shakti. And to everybody's surprise, Ma Kali started taking food from Ramakrishna's plates offering. What's happening here? Your deep surrender changes the outer phenomena also, not just the inner phenomena. The external phenomena can also change. But in Ramakrishna Paramansa, there was no Ramakrishna in, in him. He had become absolutely empty. Absolutely empty. No trace of sil slightest desire, no trace of tra trace of silent, slightest identity. There was just no trace of any ego identity in Ramakrishna Paramansa. His surrender to Makali had become supreme. And that's the reason Ramakrishna Paramansa would just be giggling, laughing, crying like a small baby. He was in Ananda, bliss all the time. Sometimes he would even complain to Makali. But that too, as a child complains to his mother. <coughs> that's what surrender is all about. Think about this. Katie, this is a beautiful path. The more you're able to cultivate this purified love and purified surrender in your heart, the more joyful this life will become for you. Even in the face of adversities, life will still be very beautiful to you. Every sur surprise of this life will give you much more joy and ananda. That's what surrender will do to you. Think about this, Katie. This could be life changing. <laughs> Thank you. Ji Swati. Ji, we have now moved to our fourth question from Louis from Auroville. Uh, the question is on the journey of motherhood. If one is already destined to become a mother, should there be an effort or emphasis on finding the beloved one, the home, the work to support the lifestyle towards the aspiration material sense? Or if it is already destined, destined, will it be best to surrender effortlessly to the unfolding of motherhood? Who's asked this question? Louis from Auroville. Okay. Louis, we need to understand a few things very clearly here. <clears throat> this question is the base of this question, as I understand, is on <clears throat> is on this age old debate between destiny and free will. If I'm destined to be mother. That's the question you asked. Let's understand this clearly. The distinction between destiny and free will. How does destiny work, Louis? Based on your past karmas or past actions, either of this life or maybe of some other life, based on those actions, you get some fruit of those actions in this life. So the fruits of those actions in this life is called destiny. Most of the time, this destiny comes to you as some specific events in your life. That's destiny. Some specific and significant events of your life. Destiny. But we also say that the power of your free will is much more stronger than the destiny. Which means, now the event has come in your life based on the past actions, past karmas. The destiny has unfolded. What you choose to do with this as your current karma is your free will. So, <clears throat> somebody has lost 
lost his job element of destiny because of the destiny that somebody has lost the job and as i said destiny could be actions of the past life or even this life this life certain action was performed by this person he lost his job but at this moment what he or she chooses to do is his free will and this person has absolute free will this person can feel absolutely miserable because he has lost the job or can look at the situation as an opportunity to do something that he always wanted to do that's his free will how he responds to this event of destiny is the free will both come together your life is made up of both these elements the fruits of the past actions which is destiny and the current effort which is your free will when you bring both of them together that's how the life is formed that's point number one of your question number two you talked about uh, setting up material house relationship love etc because of the motherhood louis there is a problem here if you are going out to look for uh, a love of your life because you want to be a mother there's a problem then your love has already become transactional your your relationship which has not yet happened has already become transactional then already you started weaving like you've started weaving a web around you that i will be a mother and then uh, be because of that or before that i need to have some love affair a partner then i have to have a house a job a material comfort and all of this you've started weaving a web and we get stuck in these webs these are webs of desires these are webs of expectations when you weave this web that i will do this and then i will do that and there's a whole sequence you already planned in your mind remember louis life does not happen the way we want it to happen life happens as a certain flow we don't know what it will throw or show you tomorrow what we, what it will present to you tomorrow we do not know and if i have weaved this web around the web of expectations and desire the web of plans life will not happen according to your plans life has its own law then it will bring a lot of pain because our plans will be shattered and it will bring a lot of agony and pain so be very mindful if you must create this web or if you stay away from it be very mindful of that next you also said should i is the, if this is destiny then i should just surrender effortlessly surrender is very powerful i just explained you surrender is very powerful if you really surrender the effortless surrender in you then all your desire of the motherhood or the definitions of motherhood or the expectation of the motherhood will also go away in surrender i'm saying nothing of you remains because the surrender that you are talking about is more like giving up i just give up and i wait for life to bring this to me there is an attitude of giving up because there is still a desire that if there is destiny of the motherhood it will come to me uh, and i just you know give up i should not make efforts around it do you follow surrender is i surrender to life if it has to happen it will happen if it does not happen i'm equally happy i'm not weaving any web of planning around or expectations around i'm not becoming obsessively attached to a thought of motherhood there's no attachment even to that life presents itself i'm here to respond to that period i'm here to take whatever life offers me as a prasad gift blessing of this life 
Prasad Bhav. That's how you start to operate your life. Yeah. Another important point here, do you must understand this also. I think you you your question said you are from Oroville. So which means you know a little bit about India. Here, all the great Devis, Shaktis, all the great women saints of India, we call them mother. Again, Ramakrishna Paramansa, his wife, Ma Sharada, we call her mother. We're not her biological children. Nobody is her biological children, but the whole world calls her the mother. What does it mean? Every saint, every woman saint, we call mother. In fact, there are a lot of male saints also, we call them mother. What is the significance of this? What's the indication of this? The indication is motherhood is not a biological phenomena. Yes, it's a biological phenomena also, but it is not only the biological phenomena. <clears throat> motherhood, being a mother, is a set of qualities. The quality of deep tenderness, the quality of unconditional love, the quality of unconditional service, the quality of unconditional embrace, the quality of absorbing, embracing, the quality of not distinguishing, the qualities to quality of no judgment, the quality of no preference between this child and that child, the quality of overflowing caring. These are the qualities of being a mother. And all the women saints of India, or say women saints of, of the entire planet, if you see, they display these qualities. To me, these are the qualities of being a mother. Either you, you produce your own biological child, or even if you don't produce your own biological child, you can still cultivate these qualities and become the mother. The mother of everybody around, the mother of all the children around, the mother of the entire people of your community. Mother is a bhav. Focus on that, cultivate that, Louis Moore. And be freed from this sense of biological attachment. All the children of this world are mine. I am the mother of all the people around here. You see, in, in south of India, there's a, there's a beautiful woman saint called Amma. She's still in body. We call her the hugging mother. She would hug everybody, every person who comes to her to take her darshan. She would just hug every person, treating, considering that person as my son or my daughter. <clears throat> the quality of motherhood. They will feed everybody, whosoever goes to their door. These mothers I'm talking about. Anybody goes to their door, they will feed them with pure love and affection. Because at the heart, they've become the mother. And most of these women saints have never had a biological child. Yeah. Mahamrita. Anandamaima. The Anandamaima. Huh? Again, we call her Ma. She is joyful mother of every person who comes to her. She would feed her, cook for her, make sure you know nobody goes out of her, her ashram or her home without food. Neem Karoli Baba, the great devotee of Lord Hanuman. You go to his ashram. And he will not let you go without food. He'll make sure that you are well fed with love and affection. He's become mother to everybody. So these are the attributes, qualities of motherhood one must cultivate. Only then and only then you will be able to experience what really being a mother is all about. Otherwise, one biological child and one gets totally attached, entangled with that. I'm not saying don't do it. 
If your heart says, go ahead. But I'm saying more than that, what is important is to cultivate these amazing, divine, sacred qualities of being a mother. That will fulfill you. We want to be a mother because we want to fulfill ourselves. A part of us we feel is not fulfilled unless we have a child. But if you have millions of children, thousands of children, hundreds of children, imagine the fulfillment of that as against one child. Think about this, Louis. It might help you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Swati, I think, uh, looking at the time. Yes. Let's, uh, before we end, let's just close our eyes, everybody. Close our eyes. Feel this moment completely. In this moment, Feel your own breath. Feel the sitting posture of your body. Feel the space around you, wherever you are sitting. And with this, feel the silence that's arising in you. Vibrations of the words that you just heard. Something is arising in you. Just experience this and be with it. Just be with it. Beautiful. In your heart, feel the great gratitude for this amazing life that we've got. This opportunity that we all have received. The blessing that we all have received, the gifts 
in the form of our loved ones, the gift in the form of our breath, in the form of this deep desire in our heart to know the truth. These are all the gifts that life has blessed us with. Feel deep gratitude for whatever life has blessed you with. And thank it. Invoke the deep inner joy and gratitude. It is an amazing life. With that, bring a smile on your face. Slowly, start to open your eyes. Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat. Om. Tat -sat. Om.